been a while. Uh, welcome back to my channel. I haven't been posting because I've been really busy um, doing my lectures, but um, I've got some revision material prepared. So uh, enjoy. I hope it helps you with your revision for the exams, which I know are coming up soon. So uh, there are a lot of debates in psychology. I'm going to focus on the main two that are going to be covered in the AS syllabus, the nature versus nurture and the individual versus situational debate. Now they're similar, but I'm going to point out some of the differences. First and foremost, nature versus nurture is about behavior, emotions and cognition, and how they are affected or influenced by genetic and inherited factors from birth. Right? So these are things you're born with, right? You're born with your genes. You have inherited factors from your parents, right? Certain predispositions you have which are which come from your ancestry, right? So these are things you cannot change. And that's why we call them nature. Right? You can't change them because you're born with them. And these things can affect your behavior, they can affect your emotions, they can also affect your cognition. Now, the second part is nurture. Nurture is always in reference to your environment and your upbringing. Right? The place that you're born in, how you're brought up at home and stuff like that, that's the nurture side of the argument. Hence the word nurture, which means like to take care of someone, to raise someone up, right? to nurture them. And that can affect our behavior, our emotions and our cognition as well. And so the debate here is that whenever someone behaves a certain way, are they behaving that way because they're born that way or because they were brought up that way? Right? Oftentimes, it's, it's, sometimes it's easy to to tell the difference. For example, uh, I have darker skin, right? I'm born that way. That's those that dark skin genes are in my blood, right? So that's clearly because I was born that way. I wasn't brought up to have dark skin, right? That, that's not something that happens. But if I'm a child and I'm throwing a tantrum on the floor in the shopping mall because my parents don't want to buy me a sweet, right? So that would be more towards my upbringing. Why am I behaving in such a terrible fashion on the floor? It's probably because my parents didn't discipline me enough when I was a younger child, right? So that's more towards upbringing. And then perhaps you can argue maybe there's some nature element there. But essentially here, you're, you're trying to argue what comes from nature and what comes from nurture, right? Now, similarly, individual versus situational. I notice students often get confused with these two, right? Individual versus situational, excuse me, the individual, the, the individual versus the situational debate also features our behavior, emotions and cognition. But what influences these things? Now, uh, similar to genetic and inherited factors, now we look at personality, right? That's the individual side of the debate. What is it about that person's own personality that influences them to do something? For example, if you remember in your AS studies, you've got a study on uh, Pilyavin, right? Pilyavin at all, on the subway Samaritans, right? So people, uh, uh, there was a victim inside the subway and they wanted to see whether people would help. Now, some people help perhaps faster than others. Some people help more than others. Why do you think that is? Maybe some people just have an individual personality that's more towards being helpful, right? I myself, I love helping people, right? If I see someone in need, I like to go and help them. I'll give you an example. Oftentimes when I'm driving on the road and I see a person pulled over and, you know, they're outside their car, their, their bonnet is open, something seems to be wrong, I often pull over and ask them, hey, what's wrong? Do you need a jump start cable? Do you need me to drive you to the nearest petrol station? Or stuff like that, right? Because my personality is just that way. I just, I'm built, in a sense, I love helping people. Right? Uh, my, but my friends might be more suspicious. They might have a more paranoid personality and they don't want to help random strangers on the side of the road because it's dangerous, right? So that's an individual difference between us in terms of our personality. And that's how we explain that part of the debate. It influences our behavior, emotions, and cognition. Now, in parallel with the nurture side of the debate, which is environment and upbringing, the situational side of the debate is the people around us or the place that we're in or so on and so forth, right? So this is anything to do with anything that's outside of us. Our personality is within us, right? It's who we are and how we, you know, how we are as a person, right? And, our, and the people around us, that's the situation. The situation that we're in can also influence us. For example, let's take Pilavin's study again, right? When, when one person goes to help, everyone else wants to help too, right? Because one person has already made the first move. So the second, the third, and the fourth person, they were influenced by the situation. It's like, oh, that guy's helping. I should go and help that guy, right? So they were influenced by the situation rather than their own personality. However, the first person who helped, most likely they were influenced by their own personality of being sympathetic or more helpful towards others, right? So although they are similar, right? Nature and nurture, individual, situational, there are some differences between them, right? If you're comparing genes versus environment and upbringing, that's a nature versus nurture issue. If you're comparing someone's individual personality versus uh, the people around them, the place that they're in, which could be influencing their behavior, that's individual versus situational, all right? 
Now, let's look at some examples. So, let's look at the biological approach. We've got three studies here, Kenley and all study, right, regarding the amygdala, Demna and Kleitman, sleeping and dreaming, uh, Schachter and Singer, SNS, right, for the uh, emotions, right, studying about emotions. Now, if you look at the biological approach, let's look at some, some, some points that we can talk about when it comes to nature and nurture. For example, first and foremost, biology is primarily a nature issue, right? Because it's, as the name suggests, biological, right? It's naturally more towards nature, biology, things you are born with, right? Now, in some of the studies, they used an EEG machine to measure brain waves and eye movements. These are all biological, internally thing, in internal uh, mechanisms that are going on, right? There are things we don't really uh, consciously control and they're things we're born with, right? Especially your brain waves. Your brain waves are purely biological. You can't really control them when you're asleep and so on and so forth, right? That gives more, more, more evidence to the nature side of the argument, right? And uh, these things help us understand biological processes a lot better, right? When you measure someone's brain waves, when you measure their eyes, right? And uh, oftentimes you can link, uh, thanks to Demon and Kleitman study, for example, you can now link dreams to eye movements, right? And even, even a fetus can have REM sleep, right? Did you know that? Yeah. So these are things that links... Um, Demon and Kleitman study, for example, towards the nature component, right? Talking about brain waves, talking about REM sleep, even in a fetus, uh, talking about how these biological processes can be linked to dreams and so on and so forth. So the, all of this points towards a nature argument, right? Because everybody seems to dream, right? Something, it seems to be something built in that we're born with, right? This ability to dream, right? Moving on, dream content, however, if you remember from Demon and Kleitman study, Dream content is different from person to person. And why do you think that is? Well, it's probably related to experiences which come from nurture, right? So yes, everybody can dream. That's a biological thing that's built in us, right? So that's the nature. But what about the nurture? Children, they might have different dreams, right? Adults, they might have different dreams. Why? Because of our experiences, our upbringing, right? If a child watches a particular cartoon and only dreams about that cartoon, that's because they were brought up in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment that had that particular stimulus or that particular cartoon or those particular experiences, right? Um, and so these differences in dreams, are they biological? No, they're most likely towards uh, the experiences that people go through, right? So they're more towards nurture. So that's how you differentiate between the evidence that supports nature and the evidence that supports nurture, right? Let's move on. What about emotions, brain and hormones? So this is more towards Kenley study, right? They're studying the brain, they're studying the hormones in the brain. Everybody experiences emotions. Oh, excuse me, not Kenley. Kenley. This is Shakta and Singh, right? Because we're talking about emotions. Uh, Kenley was more towards the amygdala, right? And memory. So when we're talking about Shakta and Singer study, right? Uh, emotions, they proved were caused uh, in the brain, right? They have cognition as well as physiological arousal, right? Everybody seems to experience some level of emotions. So it seems to be, it seems to have a biological component, particularly because they needed the injection of no, uh, uh, epinephrine to increase their physiological arousal. And that's how you link it to biological factors, to nature, essentially, right? Without the physiological arousal, you can't experience an emotion fully, right? So that's a link to nature, right? Whereas some of the participants had differences in emotional responses, right? Not everybody responded the same way. Why do you think that is? Maybe it's because of different experiences. Some people are more emotional than others because they've, brought up, they've been brought up in an environment where perhaps they can show more emotion. Let's take a simple example. Oftentimes, the stereotype is that uh, men don't show emotion as easily as women. Right now, there is some evidence to suggest that women are more uh, expressive when it comes to emotion. But generally, I believe that men and women both experience emotion. It's just that we express it differently. Right? For a woman, when she sees a, a sad movie, she's more are probably more likely to cry in front of others in the, when she's watching a sad movie. But men, perhaps, wanting to look macho and tough may not cry as much, as easily, right? Although they're experiencing the emotion the same way, they may have a different emotional response, right? They may respond differently. So those are individual differences, or in this case, we can say, perhaps brought up through experiences, right? Certain, certain, excuse me, certain stereotypes that someone's exposed to, right? So that's the nurture component versus the nature component where physiological arousal is required for everybody to experience and emotion, right? What else can we say? Okay, individual versus situational. So that's when you compare it specifically in the biological sense, then it's nature versus nurture. Now let's talk about this, as I said earlier, right? So you're crying at a sad film, right? Many participants were affected by the stooge. It was true in the case of Shakta and Singer study, right? Many of the participants were affected by the 
Remember, I said by people around them, right? That's what I talked about when I when I mentioned the um, individual versus situational debate. When it's come when it comes to individual, or in this case, excuse me, situational, you're affected by the people around you. So in this case, you're sitting in the room with a stooge, right? In Shakta and Singhastani, the stooge is doing all sorts of crazy things, or he's getting angry, and you're affected by the stooge, right? The situation is affecting your emotion, right? The same way that you see a sad film and you cry. So that's situational. Now let's compare this with individual. Not everybody cries at a sad movie, right? Right. In the same way, in Shaita and Singer study, not all the participants responded the same way. Some were more extreme than others. Some were milder than others, right? So it really depends on who the person is. That's an individual difference in their personality. Some of them are more willing to express the emotion, some are not, right? So there's, there are differences here. So this is how you compare it if it was a situational versus individual. Notice in this example, I don't talk about any biological components. I don't mention physiological arousal. I don't mention anything to do with the brain or hormones or whatever, right? If I'm mentioning that, then it goes to nature versus nature, right? Uh, what about some real-life applications? What can you guys think about? So this is a question that often comes up. Now, these kinds of questions, real-life application questions, are beyond your syllabus. You kind of have to come up with an idea of your own, right? So if you think about Kenley and all study, what kind of ideas can you come up with when it comes to applying that study? Essentially, what the real-life application is all about is taking the results of the study and thinking of a useful way of helping someone in real life with those results. So we know from Kenley and all study, that the amygdala plays an important role, right? When you see something that's particularly arousing and emotional, you're more likely to remember that, that stimulus, which is the case that we saw in the results, right? People are more likely to remember those intense images. So what could an application be? Well, perhaps maybe advertising companies could then put more um, intense images into the advertising to create uh, an emotional experience in participants, so excuse me, in, in viewers, so that it triggers the amygdala. And if it triggers the amygdala, they're more likely to remember that particular brand or product, right, in the advertisement, which is what you see sometimes. Like I've seen a um, fire safety hazard, as, um, excuse me, fire safety advertisements featuring people who've been burned severely by fires. Right? And so that creates this emotional, um, you know, emotional intense feeling in you and that it triggers your amygdala and you remember like, wow, okay, I got to make sure that, you know, I buy this brand of fire extinguisher, for example, right? Uh, what about Demon Enlightenment? So Demon Enlightenment was studying about sleeping, about dreaming and stuff like that. What's a simple um, um, application that we could think of? Well, oftentimes we can also think about how we can be... Um, how we can help people in therapy. So because we've understood more about sleeping and dreaming, perhaps we could apply this in therapy sessions to help people with sleep or dream disorders, help them understand their disorders, um, help them, um, 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 excuse me, help give therapists some, some, some uh, information regarding the fact that they can now measure uh, dreams accurately by using simple, uh, something as simple as an EEG machine. Then most likely you can st study how people dream, you can understand how dreaming occurs in more depth, you can help people with dreaming disorders, uh, anything along those lines, right? That would be a useful uh, application, for instance. Another one could be for Shakta and Singer study. Now, Shakta and Singer were studying about emotions, right? How physiological arousal and the cognitive labeling is required for emotions. How could you help people in that situation? Well, perhaps someone is suffering through a, a very emotional experience and you know that their emotional experience, perhaps it's a very negative emotion that they're feeling and you as a therapist, you want to help them control that negative emotion better. So you can tell them that, hey, you know, your negative emotion is partly due to the cognitive label, but it's also due to the physiological arousal. So what you could perhaps encourage that person to do is to do some deep breathing exercises. Hey, relax, relax, relax. And as you relax, you bring down your physiological arousal. And guess what? You feel less emotional, right? So isn't that a good, I mean, that's, I, I would say that's a pretty good example for a real life application for Shakta and Singer, right? The study itself was rather complicated and students often find it difficult to understand. But the, the, the application is really useful. Hey, if you're feeling emotional, take a few deep breaths, calm yourself down, lower your heart rate. And once you're more relaxed and less physiologically aroused, guess what? You're going to feel less emotion. I think that's a pretty good application. Okay, now let's jump over to the cognitive approach. So in cognitive, we've got Andrade with doodling, Baron Cohen with autism and the theory of mind, and Laney studying false, uh, false memories. Okay, so what can we say about nature and nurture in some of these studies, right? So autism, let's look at Baron Cohen first. Autism, now there is some evidence um, in research outside of your syllabus that autism is caused by genetics. Now we don't know that 100% for sure, right? There is no autistic gene that we've identified. Right? So um, there is some research also being done into environmental factors, 
right? Sometimes two perfectly healthy adults can end up with an autistic child. Why would that be? If they're both healthy, it shouldn't be the case, right? So maybe there are some environmental factors, nurture factors such as pollutants, infections, or perhaps problems during pregnancy that could be outside of the biological component. So we call that perhaps nurture uh, influences. We don't know for sure what causes autism, right? Um, individual versus situational. Well, what about doodling, right? Doodling affected recall. That's situational, right? Because doodling was part of the situation, right? Doodling is something you do outside of yourself. It's nothing to do with your internal personality in any sense, right? It's something that you're doing in, as part of the situation. I'm making participants doodle, or in this case, I'm encouraging participants to doodle. And because they doodled as part of the situation, guess what? It affected their recall, right? So it affected their behavior. Right, uh, boredom induced doodling as well. So Andrade tried to make the situation as boring as possible. Right, remember what she did? She played the tape recorder at, the, at a monotonous, uh, with a monotonous voice at a certain speed. It was very boring. The place that they were in was very dull, nothing interesting. And so when you create a situation that's boring, you induce boredom, which then leads to doodling, right? Because people often doodle when they're bored. And so that was part of the situation. And the situation affected their behavior, which was in this case doodling. What about the differences in doodling behavior? If you remember from the doodling study, some people doodled less and some people doodled more, right? Some people only doodled, doodled a few shapes and some people doodled more than a hundred shapes, right? So why would that be? Why such a big difference? Well, individual differences in behavior, right? Some people, perhaps, they like to doodle a lot, right? And so they doodle as much as they can in the short time that they were given, right? So that is an individual difference compared to the situation, right? Let's see, people with ASHFA scored lower on the eye test, all right? So that's an individual thing, right? Because it's individually within you, whether you have autism or not, right? The autism is not something that exists outside of you, right? But everybody saw the same pictures. That's the situational part, right? You show the same set of pictures to everybody, so that's the situation that you put everybody in, the situation the same. But some people respond differently. Why? Because individually, they might have some differences. In this case, they may have autism or they may not have autism, right? Some do worse than others on the eye test, and that shows evidence for the individual side of the debate, okay? What else do we have? All right, embedding a false memory. That's what's situational, right? So Lainey created a situation, right, We're using the fake profile, for a fake computer-generated profile, and embedded a false memory into people. That was the situation. It was something that was outside of the person, right, situational. And what about the different levels of liking, right? Some people like asparagus more, some people like asparagus less. Why would that be? Well, it's due to individual differences. Perhaps some people, their personality is that they like eating vegetables more, right? You enjoy eating vegetables, so you're going to like asparagus probably a little bit more. Right? So those are individual differences compared to the situation where everybody was in the same situation, they all uh, were embedded with a false memory. In this case, the love condition was embedded with a false memory. But in spite of that, not all of them reacted the same way. Some turned out as believers, some became non-believers. Right? So that difference is to do with your personality, or rather in this case, the individual side of the debate. Right? Some in the love group did not believe. Right? Why not? Well, maybe, maybe they had an individual difference. Their personality was that they were, they were more paranoid, perhaps. They were not as susceptible to, 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 to uh, deception, perhaps. Right? And whatever other reason you can think of that makes sense here. Right? Now, what about some real-life applications? Right. So Andrade studies about doodling. What a very simple application is that if you're in a boring lecture, your lecturer should encourage students, hey guys, why don't you just doodle a little bit and that will increase your uh, memory retention, right? But we don't exactly know how it works, but we know that it seems to work, right? As long as you keep yourself aroused mentally, you seem to be able to retain more in your memory, right? So encourage students to doodle in a boring lecture. That could be one possible example of an application, right? What about Baron Cohen's study, right? When it comes to autism and theory of mind, what could you use his study for? Well, when you think about it, his study was about, you know, understanding first and foremost, a therapist could probably use the uh, eyes test, right, to help diagnose people who might have autism, right? They might show them these pictures and say, hey, why don't you look at these pictures, try and pick out the right emotional word that's associated with the eyes, right? The emotion that's associated with the eyes. And if they pick the right one, then that's great. If they start picking the wrong ones and they, they do that repeatedly, then you can sort of like refer them perhaps to a specialist and say that, oh, uh, you know, you might have some autistic characteristics. Maybe you, maybe you might be suffering from autism. Let's start this therapeutic uh, treatment early, right? So intervention is always good to start early, as early as possible, so that you can help people live better 
uh, quality lives, right? So that could be a good diagnostic tool when it comes to diagnosing autism. Perhaps you could even use it as a training tool, right? To train people who have autism, hey, you know, if you use this tool, maybe you can look at these eyes, at these pictures of eyes, and we can train a person to recognize what emotion is being shown, right? So that's another application that's possible, right? What about Laney study? When it comes to eating certain types of food and you want to implant a memory into them, well, maybe they're obese or maybe they've got some health problems or they're having difficulty uh, following a particular diet for their health. And maybe the um, dietitian could, could perhaps uh, implant a small false memory in them and say, hey, did you know your mother told me that you enjoyed eating broccoli when you were a young boy? And they're like, really? Wow, okay, wow, maybe I should eat more broccoli, right? So, I mean, yes, you might think, oh, that's very unethical. You're lying to participants. But in this case, we're talking about it in terms of an application rather than ethics, right? In terms of application, perhaps for someone who's severely suffering with obesity or diet, diet problems, right? You may want to just put a false memory in them that positively impacts them in their life and allows them to perhaps be more likely to pick up healthier foods, right? And that could be a good application for them, right? Or perhaps, uh, yeah, something along those lines. Application questions are usually quite open-ended. As long as we can think of an application that um, is, is in alignment with the study and what the study was researching about and the findings that they found, then you should be fine, right? And always make sure you focus on the usefulness of the application. How is it useful to people, right? What about the learning approach? Okay, so in learning approach, we've got Bandura and aggression, Savidra and Silverman when it comes to uh, the button phobia, and Pepperberg, right, regarding Alex the parent, okay? What can we say about nature versus nurture? Well, boys were definitely more aggressive than females, particularly towards physical aggression. They were more physically aggressive than females, and a lot of research has proven this to be true. Testosterone is linked to physical aggression, so that's an evidence for nature. Why were boys more physically aggressive? Well, because they've got testosterone. Testosterone is something you are born with, not something you can control on command, right? It's not something that you're brought up with, right? It's something you're born with, and that's evidence clearly for nature. Right? But boys were also aggressive. Maybe they were more aggressive because they had learned masculine type behavior. Right? That's nurture. Right? Perhaps they had seen other men being more aggressive on TV, fighting, boxing, kicking, whatever. And that's why they were more aggressive. Right? So are boys more aggressive because they're socialized to be? Right? Because of nurture? Or are they more aggressive because they've got testosterone and that makes them more aggressive? This is an excellent example of the debate. How do you know? Well, we debate it out, right? We look for evidence to support the nature. We look for evidence to support the nature and we discuss it, right? Uh, influenced by different models could be a, is more like more likely a case of nurture, right? Just like how girls, perhaps, girls, you know, were influenced by the female models more than the guys were influ influenced by the male models, right? So phobias, now we talk about phobias in Savidra Silverman study, right? Classical conditioning is clearly a nurture thing. Why is it? Because you're not born with the phobia, right? If you remember the boy's story, he was a few years old in kindergarten when the buttons fell on him. Before that, he had never had any issues with buttons, right? So it wasn't something he was born with because as a small child, he had no problems. Only after that incident, right? If he was conditioned then to fear buttons. In this case, he was disgusted by them, right? So that's clearly a nurture, right? Because it's an experience that happened as he was growing up. What else? We can talk about Alex the parent, right? Operant conditioning and social learning, these are clearly nurture components, right? When you think about it, Alex the parent was taught how to speak. He was taught how to recognize certain colors, certain shapes, certain materials, right? That's something that he was taught to do. He was not, he, he was not born with the knowledge of English language or born knowing how to differentiate between these particular objects. That's something that they used uh, uh, behavioral techniques to teach him. Right, so any, any, anything behavioral, when it comes to operant conditioning, classical conditioning, social learning, these are very, very clearly nurture components, right? It's something that we have brought up with our learning, right? Uh, using the model rival approach for label acquisition, teaching him how to know certain labels, that's all to do with nurture. What about nature? Nature is actually do with his, with his cognitive ability, right? That is something that was not taught to him. Right? Remember, he's able to identify the differences between same and different for the familiar objects, objects which he's seen many, many times and trained on. And then when novel objects were introduced, objects that he has never seen before right, or might not be familiar with, he was still able to differentiate between same and different. Why? Because his cognitive ability, which was nature, could transfer between the familiar and novel objects. So that was the nature component. His intelligence as a parent, that's nature. You're born with it, right? They're born with that cognitive ability but he had to learn how to acquire certain labels for words, right? Yeah, so this generalizing of information to novel objects, that's nature. 
Now, some of my students often write things like, oh, uh, Alex the parrot had a certain type of beak that had the ability to uh, uh, vocalize human sound. And they said that's evidence for nature. Well, that's not, well, I mean, logically that is true. Yes, the parrots are born a certain way genetically that they are equipped with a certain vocal range that they can mimic human sound, right? That's, I don't deny that. But with regards to this study, when we're talking about the results and, and the findings of the study, we're not focused on Alex's biology as a parrot. Rather, we're focused on his cognition, his ability to differentiate between same and different. Right? So that's actually what we're focusing on here, his ability to cognitively uh, uh, generalize the information from novel objects, from, sorry, from, excuse me, from familiar objects to novel objects. Right? That's a nature component. They didn't teach him on the new objects. He just knew it. Right? Right? Nobody had taught him to generalize. That was his innate cognitive ability, something he was born with. Let's move on. Individual versus situational, right? Model, behavior, and gender, that's situational. This is due with Bandura study, right? In Bandura study, the models were either aggressive or non-aggressive. Their behavior, their gender were part of the situation that the children were in, right? That was not something the children could control. It's not something within the child. It's something in the situation outside of the child, right? So how did that influence their behavior? Well, boys followed the male model. Girls followed the female model, uh, the children in general followed the aggressive model and copied their aggression. They also followed the non-aggressive model and were, were less aggressive and were more uh, docile, right? Boys and girls imitate different behaviors. Now that's individual, right? Situationally, all of them were exposed to a similar situation using the models and the gender of the models. But individually, some of them responded differently, right? Some of the boys, for example, picked up guns. And boys were more likely to play with the guns more than the girls. Right? The, the guns, because perhaps boys, individually, their personality, perhaps they, they you know, uh, 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 got this idea that boys should be more aggressive, play with guns, and so on and so forth. Girls, what kind of toys were the girls picking up? Tea sets, maybe the, the dolls, and so on and so forth, right? So girls, perhaps at the individual difference in them, right? They were picking more feminine toys, right? So that's at the individual level of difference, right? That's evidence that, you know, their behavior is being governed by an individual factor between boys and girls. Right? Whereas when it comes to their, uh, the situation, the situation is also affecting them. And that's the situational side of the debate. Right? So you can see a clear difference here between what's in the situation outside of the children and what's within the children, right? their individual differences and their personality differences. What else can we say? Alex scored higher on the novel objects versus familiar objects. Right? Situationals can seem to affect uh, his cognitive ability. Right? So in this case, if you remember in Pepperberg's study, Pepperberg actually said, that Alex scored higher on novel objects. M mind you, novel objects are objects he may not have seen before in his life, right? So why did he score higher? Well, according to Pepperberg, she believed that he scored higher because he likes to play with his objects, right? Every time he gets it right, he gets to uh, pack the objects, play with them, they become part of his toys, right? And he likes to play with toys. And perhaps because those toys were new, he paid more attention to them and he was more accurate in identifying same versus different to do with the novel objects. So again, that's part of the situation, right? It's part of the situation that I provide, or rather Pepperberg provided novel versus familiar objects and so on and so forth, and that affected his behavior. He became more accurate, right, because of the situation. But you could also argue individually, Alex perhaps is a parrot that just, you know, has a very curious personality. And that's why he, he performed better, right? So once again, the individual situational debate on nature versus nurture, it's all a big debate, right? There's no real right or wrong, strictly speaking. It's, it's all about how you justify your points. What evidence can you give to justify, right? Now, children in research, we also have to, to, to talk about this slightly, right? Because, you know, there are a lot of ethical issues with using children in research. In Bandura's case, there was no consent from the children. Right? Parents, did they give consent? Not clear, right? So it's unethical, right? Children in research is one of the issues that you can actually talk about in your uh, essays, right? So you can talk about the fact that Bandura did not get consent from parents, didn't get it from the children, it makes it a rather unethical study, right? Why? Because children are a vulnerable group. Nobody had, nobody can, they can't speak out for themselves, so we have to protect them, right? However, on the other side, because it's a debate, right? Oftentimes in your evaluation questions, you have to give you know, advantage, disadvantage, strength, weakness. It's a debate, so you have to think of points to support the idea of using children. Why is it ideal to use children? Well, first and foremost, children have less exposed to violence, so there are less extraneous variables, right? For people, for example, if Bandura were to conduct his study in with a group of military war veterans who have lived through war and seen violence on a scale that nobody else can imagine, and then sees you know, a model taking a, a mallet and whacking a bobo doll, do you think they'd react? Probably not, right? But children, having been less exposed, they're more of like a blank slate. So I can see like, you know, how humans really react uh, when you use children sometimes. 
also children ideal in experiments. Why? Because they have less demand characteristics, right? A child who's naive can't possibly figure out that, hey, you know, there's this guy named Milgram who's doing, oh, excuse me, Bandura, who's doing this really interesting research on, 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 on modeling and, and aggression and all that. Children don't understand that. They wouldn't figure out the aim of the study, right? So that's demand characteristics being much, much lower and therefore the study results being more valid, right? So that's why it's ideal to use children. So like any good issue or debate, whether it's nature, nurture, individual, situational, using children in research or not, you must be able to provide at least two sides of the coin, right? You must be able to debate and discuss, hey, on one hand, it's not good to use children because it's unethical without consent. But on the other hand, you know, it's ideal to use children, right? Maybe because there's low demand characteristics and so on and so forth, right? What about else? For phobias, right? So for phobias in Savidra study, it was highly distressing the form of treatment that they were using. They were exposing him to buttons, the very thing that he's so mortally afraid of, right? So that's rather unethical when you think about it. Why? Because he's just a child. He's only a few years old, right? He's vulnerable. He has mental health conditions, right? In this case, he's clinically diagnosed with a phobia. That's, that's a serious mental health condition, right? And you're exposing him to his phobia over and over again to try and get him to... I mean, the, 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 the goal is to get him to overcome the phobia. That's a great goal. But in doing so, you're distressing him, right? And that's not ethical, right? Because you're not protecting the child. However, on the other hand, you can argue for it, right? Because they did, they did get consent from the mother and also from the son, right? The intention was also good. They wanted to help treat him. Yes, a little bit of suffering was good because in the end result, they wanted to make him better, right? What about using animals in research, right? Animals, Alex, for example, was an intelligent animal, but is it ethical to be kept in capti captivity? Was it? Not really, right? So there's an issue with ethics there. Alex is a wild animal. He should be in the wild with his own kind, not in a foreign environment such as a laboratory being experimented on, right? Is it ethical? But at the same time, we can argue for the flip side. Alex was treated very, very well. He had food, water, freedom. If you wanted to go somewhere, you just needed to ask. If you wanted food and water, it was all there freshly available every single day, right? So on one hand, yes, it's not ethical to treat, uh, to, to put animals in, 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 in artificial environment. They should be in the wild where they belong. But on the other hand, even though he was in an experiment, he was treated very, very well, right? Uh, oops, sorry, I skipped one. I skipped one. So now when we talk about real life application, we also want to talk about the applications for Bandura study, Samvidra and Silverman and Pepperberg. Sorry, I think I mixed up my slides a little bit. But essentially, when, let's look at this, right? So Bandura, we talked about modeling, how they model certain behaviors, talking about aggression and stuff like that. So what can we say? What's a very simple, uh, the first thing that comes to mind, when it comes to application, right? To teach kids to be less aggressive. What should parents do? Parents should model good behaviors at home, right? They should also perhaps monitor what TV programs children are watching. Make sure that they don't have access to violent television, for example, like boxing, kicking, fighting, and stuff like that, right? Make sure they have only got access to like kid-friendly shows, PG-13 shows, um, um, uh, you know, um, um, shows that are promoting good values, right? At the same time, parents should not argue or fight at home. Why? Because children are watching. They'll model that behavior. Right? Especially if you have a child at home, they, they're always listening, they're always watching you, right? So parents should also be careful. Teachers can also model good behavior in classroom environments, right? So that students can model that behavior, right? What about Severian and Silverman? We talked about the boy with the button phobia. What's a good life application? Well, they found a treatment that works, right? So for, for participants who have phobias, right, particularly evaluative uh, phobia, evaluative learning for based phobias, where you, you evaluate something as negative, uh, as disgusting. In this case, the boy felt and smelt that buttons were disgusting. So his phobia was based on evaluative learning. He evaluated uh, the buttons as disgusting, right? Rather than expectancy learning, where you expect something bad to happen, right? This is evaluative learning in his case. So you could easily apply to any other phobias based on evaluative learning. For example, I have a friend who has a phobia of snails. And I asked him, why are you afraid of snails? When was the first time that this happened? And he told me when he was a young boy, his brother and him were looking at some snails and his brother smashed a snail open and it was just really disgusting and the snail was everywhere and all that. And when he said that, I was like, wow, you are just like the boy with the button phobia. You evaluate snails as disgusting. Not, not scary, they're disgusting. You are responding as a phobia, right? You're afraid of them, but the root of that is actually in disgust, which is really quite interesting. So to help him, I would then use the same methods and techniques that Savidra and Silverman used, which was imaginal desensitization. Imagine snails coming towards you and then slowly relax, relax yourself until you're finally able to overcome the fear.
right? Last but not least, Pepperberg, right? What can we uh, learn from Pepperberg study and apply it? Well, primarily, remember Pepperberg used a very nice training module called the model rival approach. That's a pretty useful approach. It's very successful with Pepperberg. Perhaps it could also be applied to children, right? You want to teach children how to model good behaviors, how to recognize certain concepts, how to learn certain labels, Perhaps you could use the model rival approach in teaching young children how to learn certain labels or certain things that you want them to, 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 to pick up from, right? By watching an adult perform the behavior first and then learning from that modeling, right? So those are ways that you can apply these three studies, right? All right, last but not least, let's look at the social approach, right? Milgram, Tiliavin, and Yamamoto. Milgram, as we know, is the guy who likes to electrocute people, electrocution and stuff like that, right? To do with destructive obedience. We've got Tiliavin, Tiliavin, the Subway Samaritans, and, and, and Yamamoto, last but not least, with chimpanzee and helping behavior, right? Individual versus situational. Ah, so talking about Milgram, right? First up, authority figure and environment, well, that's clearly situational. Right? If you think about the fact that the person was wearing a technician's coat, right? they were conducting in a, in a reputable university, everything looked very official, right? the environment was set up to look very, very, very convincing that this was a real electrocution that was going on. Right? So that's situational. Right? And the situation affected some participants' behavior. Right? At the same time, some participants were resistant to authority. Right? They disobeyed. Why do you think they did? Right? Everybody was in the same situation. In fact, a majority of participants obeyed. Why did they obey? Because the situation influenced them to obey. And some participants defied orders. They said, no, I'm not going to continue electrocuting that man. Right? So that's an individual difference, right? Because between each person, some stopped earlier, some stopped later, some didn't stop at all. So that's an individual difference in the sense perhaps something within their personality, perhaps they're very empathetic, perhaps they have, they got a strong moral conscience and they resist the destructive obedient authority, right? What else can we say? Okay, for chimpanzees, most chimps showed similar behavior offering tools. Excuse me, similar behavior offering of tools. Oh, sorry, I think I made a slight error there. So it showed similar behavior in offering the tools, right? So individually, they seem to all want to offer help, but some showed a specific behavior, right? Excuse me, let me rephrase what I said. Situationally, when they were given a certain amount of tools, they were all willing to help, right? They all showed the same similar kind of helping behavior as long as the tools were provided in the situation where the other chimpanzee, chimpanzee needed their help, right? But some showed very specific behavior, Right? Some showed a specific preference for a non-tool. I believe one of the chimps kept offering a brush to the other chimp. Right? That's an individual difference. It was not caused by the situation because all the chimps were exposed to the brush, but only one of them kept offering that brush to the other partner chimp. Right? Uh, some, some ch one chimp, right? Ayumu, if I'm not mistaken, was a problem solver. Right? He kept looking over the opaque panel. Right? The other chimps didn't do that. They were in the same situation. Right? They could put their hands through the panel, but they could not... Uh, uh, they did not make an effort to look through, whereas Ayumu did. He looked through the little hole in the opaque panel to help his mother, right? So there was an individual difference. He's more curious, he's a bit of a problem solver, right? So there were individual differences indeed between the chimps. What about using animals in research? Some comparison can be made between chimps and young adults, uh, young infants, usually for real life applications or stuff like that. We usually try to compare between animals and adults. Uh, if we use animals in research, we usually try to find a way to compare them with young adults. In this case, uh, uh, excuse me, with adults. In this case, because the chimps, uh, it's more applicable perhaps to young infants, right? Adults have a very different cogn cognitive ability compared to chimps. Right? Cognitive processes of chimps are similar to that of young infants. The theory of mind of chimps are probably similar to young infants. Their social structures are also similar. Right? Uh, chimpanzees live in a so so uh, social structure environment. Uh, uh, adult humans and infant humans, we also have our own social structures. And the, uh, But there are some differences between chimps and humans, right? the way that chimps act, the way humans act, and so on and so forth. Right? So when it comes to using animals in research, uh, and I'm not sure why I didn't talk about ethics here, you can actually mention a bit about ethics about using chimpanzees. They did use a minimum number of chimpanzees as possible, which was about five or six. Right? They didn't use like 10 or 20 chimpanzees, so they tried to reduce the physical distress that could come from housing them in an artificial environment. That being said, the chimpanzees were in a wildlife preserve or wildlife habitat, if I remember correctly. So that's one point in favor for using animals in research. They made sure that they were well taken care of. Right? What about some real life applications from Milgram, Piliavin, Yamamoto? Well, from Milgram, we know that people will obey uh, situations where they're pressured to obey an authority figure. 
right? So when we, we know that for sure, so we have to have some system of checks and balances. For example, some companies have something that's known as a whistleblowing policy. A whistleblowing policy is whereby a company says that to the employees, let's say they notice someone doing something that's illegal and they have a whistleblowing policy where they can report that behavior, perhaps of a superior that did something illegal, report it to the human resource team and the human resource team will take action and nothing bad will happen to the employee, right? Because sometimes employees are afraid to report for fear of losing their jobs. But the whistleblowing policy allows them to report. So this prevents destructive obedience. Right? If a supervisor says, hey, just close one eye, don't worry, you know you know, and I know, and then we just keep quiet, right? And everybody's on the same page. But that, that you know, if they had fallen into that, they would be following similarly to how a, a, the um, experimenter told them to increase the electric shocks, right? They just follow blindly without resisting, right? So to prevent that from happening, a whistleblowing policy is a good policy to have, right? What about Pilyavin's study when it comes to helping behavior? Well, in this case, it's good. We see that a majority of people do seem to help, right? The more people there are, the faster the helping behavior becomes, right? So it's, it's good in this sense. Um, 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 we noticed there was a slight, for example, uh, um, I think of a good example of the uh, real life application. Suddenly forgot what the application is that I usually give my students. Uh, okay, make sure that if you're in a, uh, I believe if you're if you're gonna be, if, if you're in a difficult situation, make sure first and foremost that you are sober and that you are you quickly find a a a, a large. Uh, places with large groups of people, right? Try to avoid places where you're walking alone because people are less likely to help you and there's nobody around, right? Always, if you're, especially if, you're, for example, a single person walking alone, make sure you choose areas that are brightly lit, that are a lot of people there as well. And as long as there are a lot of people there, most likely you're going to receive help, right? But if you're going to be in an area that is empty without any people, then you should you should learn to take extra precautions, right? Because an application from Pilavin study shows that the more people there are, the more likely and the, more, the faster you are more likely to receive help, okay? Uh, Yamamoto study about chimpanzees. So this one's specifically about chimpanzees, but you could po possibly uh, uh, um, apply it to perhaps, you know, um, um, young adults like children, for example. Uh, teachers perhaps could implement a similar scenario where a, uh, uh, someone needs help and the other person helps them uh, regardless of whether they receive a reward in return, right? If you want to teach this idea of altruistic behavior in young people, you can set up a situation where someone is helping another person, but that person doesn't receive anything in return, and therefore that perhaps might influence other people watching to, 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 to what's the word for it, to, to, to repeat altruistic behavior, right? Or you put children in a similar situation where they need to help a friend, but they receive nothing in return, right? To teach them the idea of altruism and so on and so forth, right? Besides that, you can also, you know, in, the, in a sense, apply it to the fact that you understand more, more deeply about how chimpanzees uh, uh, work together, right? With Re regards to helping behavior, right? So designing a study, okay, I'm actually going to talk about designing a study in a future video, right? I'm preparing it, in, I'm in the midst of preparing it, but essentially designing a study, things like what, how, who, where, ethics and data, uh, my, this, this slide is still in construction, but don't worry, I'll be uploading another video very soon about how to design a study, right? How to, how to answer design study question, right? Some reminders for all of you sitting for exam soon. Exam tips, please read the questions carefully, circle keywords. What I notice is that students often miss out marks because they, they, they don't answer the question properly. They think they're answering the question, they give me a different point, right? Uh, so read the question, circle the keywords, and make sure you know what is the question really asking you about, right? Think like an examiner. When you're a student taking an exam, oftentimes you think like a student, you get stressed out, you suddenly blank out. Instead, set yourself the mindset of an examiner. Imagine that you are a Cambridge examiner and you are taking this exam. How would you answer it? What kind of answer do you think would convince a Cambridge examiner, right? Always answer every question. Please, 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 if you're listening to this video, do not, I repeat, do not leave any question blank. Make sure you just give it a try. Remember, Cambridge marking system is a positive marking system, which means as long as you've got some points there, the Cambridge markers will give you marks, right? If you get something wrong, they're not going to minus your marks. So don't worry about minus marks. Just make sure that you answer every single question. Give it your best. Just try. Leave nothing blank because you might just get one mark. Who knows, right? It's better than zero, right? Now, uh, grounding is an important psychological concept, right, in therapy. Grounding means that you remind yourself if you are losing control, if you're getting very stressed, very worked up, what you, what you should do is that remember where you are. You're sitting in an exam hall, on a chair, 
what the sounds are in the room, how your blood is pumping, how, how you feel and all that. And then you should practice breathing. Focus on your breathing. Just breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out and ground yourself in that moment. Rather than allow your emotions to run wild, you need to ground yourself in that moment, in that present moment and be present. Breathe deeply, ground yourself and you should be fine. This will help take away your exam jitters. Right? And please, 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 I always encourage my students, please use good handwriting. There's no point if you have the best answers in the world, but I can't read what you've written, right? So please have good handwriting. Here's a quick quote to encourage you. You've got what it takes, but now it will take everything you've got, right? So for those of you sitting forward, are looking forward to your exams, you know, when I was a student, I always looked forward to my exam because I spent all these months and months and months studying so hard, I wanted to pay off. I look forward to my exam to challenge myself to do my best, right? I'm sure you guys can do it, right? Now, I'm offering something particularly special. I'm offering some premium study notes, right? So I've prepared my study notes for uh, many of the chapters in AS Psychology and I'm going to be offering it on a donation basis, right? So this is a donation basis. I don't have a particular charge that I'm going to set, uh, but I will allow you to unlock these notes uh, if you donate any amount, right? So my, these are my personal notes for the Cognitive Learning and Social Studies in AS, right? I'm also going to throw in some uh, notes on assumptions, applications, and the psychology being investigated for each of these studies. Oftentimes, you'll see past questions asking about this, right? Explain the assumptions of this approach, or what is the application for this study, or what's the psychology being investigated, right? So I've got some notes prepared on that, which have been adapted from past questions. I'm also going to throw in a link with all the past papers and marking schemes from the year 2018 to 2020 for our syllabus 9990 AS Psychology. Uh, I've downloaded it all for you so you don't have to waste time searching for it online and downloading it separately. It's all there ready for you. Um, once again, this is based on the donation basis. Um, as you know, lectures don't earn much. So if you feel like donating, just go to that link. There's a link provided, tinyurl.com uh, slash premium notes. Fill up the form. It's a Google form. Fill it up with your name, your emails, uh, your payment method, and, uh, and, and make sure after you've paid, you've sent me a receipt to my email. Once I receive the receipt and I receive your Google form link, I, uh, Google, excuse me, Google form reply, I will send you a link on Google Drive with uh, the all the notes and uh, extra uh, bonus materials attached, okay? So if you don't mind supporting me, that'll be a great help. Um, if you can't afford it, no worries. You can always support me by liking, commenting, and subscribing to all my videos, right? Uh, my name is Ross. It's always been a pleasure teaching you guys. And if you want to follow me on Instagram, you can. Some people have followed me on Instagram and they sometimes DM me some encouraging messages there. That's really nice of you guys. My Instagram is at magicross7. Okay, thank you very much for watching this video. I'm going to be uploading a few more videos on revision and all the best for your exams.